freezing and you're not going to understand that I am roasting right now, <laughs> but I'll have to put that on a little bit later. I don't get it, amen? What did I say? Heaven, men are from Mars and women are from Venus or something like that? I, I guess there must be a difference in the temperatures. I, haven't, I don't have it on the top of my head uh, as far as those planets go, but praise the Lord. Take your Bible, please, this morning. Turn to Matthew chapter 27 with me. Matthew chapter 27. You know, I'm so glad God doesn't change. Amen. 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 So, so thankful. We change. God doesn't. Praise the Lord. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Amen. We are going to move back into trying to finish a series we started some time ago. And uh, it is about meeting people on the Calvary Road. And in case you think we've exhausted it, we haven't yet because uh, there's another important person I want to talk to you about. And I want to start in Matthew chapter number 27. Now, this is one of those issues where this particular Bible character, and I, I don't call him a Bible character in the sense that this is just some story that somebody made up, but this individual in history, uh, the Bible just doesn't record much about him. But what it does record about him is very weighty. And you find that each of the four evangelists here in the Gospels, they, they all record something, but they don't record much. But what they do record is different than what the others have recorded, even in some small minor ways. And what you begin to get is you begin to get this fuller picture of this individual as you begin to go through all four of the Gospels. And so I want to start in Matthew and see what he has to say about this man. And I'm preaching today on a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. Amen. And uh, I want to, first of all, state that in reference to his life, I want you to see that he was an absolute true disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, there is no fake in this stuff. This is, this is a man that we can look to and we can see how he acted, how he responded, uh, you know, what he did towards Christ and all of that. And we can just literally take some of these principles, apply them to our life, and they're just great and weighty matters. So I want to look at this man's life. He's not talked about much uh, from pulpits, but I do want to spend the time uh, gleaning all that we can about him here from the Scripture. So Matthew 27, we'll start reading in verse number 57. If you'll look over there with me, verse number 57. And we'll go down through verse number 66 in this first gospel and see what Matthew records about... Um, Sorry, I'm just making sure. Okay, got everything going here. For some reason, it's wanting me to connect the Wi-Fi. Matthew chapter 27, verse number 57. The Bible said, When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. Now, what even is this? So we're right on the heels of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to get to this a little bit later, but yes, it was a physical death. It was a 100% death. By the way, there's only really one kind of a physical death, and that is 100%. Amen? amen. Uh, somebody sits up in a casket, I'm going to run just like you are. Amen? But uh, this is right on the heels of Jesus' death. Verse 58, <clears throat> he went to Pilate, the Bible said, and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. Now, I just want you to simply know one thing here, and that is that we see the posture of this man when he went. I, I see him as he's going to beg. When you think of a beggar, you think of someone falling on their knees, someone casting themselves down and bleeding uh, very strongly. And the Bible said he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. I want you to take a note that this cloth was clean for the Lord Jesus Amen. and laid it in his own new tomb. No junk for Jesus there is a brand new tomb. Amen. Uh, I have been amazed at all those that wanted to give things to the church through the years after they had used it, abused it, it was broken down and worth nothing. Then they wanted to give it to Jesus. But no, this is not the case with Joseph of Arimathea. The Bible said he laid in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary uh, sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I'll rise again. Command, therefore, 
that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, you have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now take your Bible, flip to the next gospel and the 15th chapter of the book of Mark. And look with me, if you would, down to verse number 43. I'll try to hasten through these. I'd like to read them and preach about them later, but for some reason I get caught on some of these principles and don't want to miss them at all in the message. Amen. Verse number 43, the Bible said, Joseph of Arimathea, now notice this new material being introduced. And again, the Bible's complimentary, never contradictory. So we're adding information. An honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God. Now, all this had been introduced previously, and it just goes to show you that you need to study to show thyself approved unto God. And there's always something else the Bible says, either by inference or uh, some other connection that you might find, or sometimes specifically stated as it does here. And so just keep that in mind as you study your Bible. This is all important information. He came and went in boldly unto Pilate. Now watch this. And said he craved the body of Jesus. Now, not only do we see the posture of the begging and the pleading, but now we find that this was not just an outward act. It was not done to impress anybody. But there was a craving in his heart to do something for the Lord Jesus. He desired to serve God. And all that we ever do in the name of God ought to grow out of our deep abiding love for Him, our appreciation for what He's done for us. We love Him because He first loved us. And our service is an outgrowth of that love for Him. We find that in the life of Joseph. I'm trying to tell you, this is not fake Christianity here. He craved to do this for the Father to take care of His Son's body. The Bible said, and Pilate marveled if he were already dead. Now, this is interesting because it shows the immediacy with which he attempted to serve God. As soon as the Lord, the Father had laid it upon his heart to take care of the body, he immediately, it seems, moved with fear, as Noah did at one time. And uh, because Pilate said, is he even dead yet? I mean, you want to do this, and you know, it's a great thing and all, but, but is he even dead? And by the way, whenever God lays something upon your heart, don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't try to figure it out better. Just follow the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit have control of your life. He'll never fail you if it is indeed the Holy Spirit of God. So the Bible said he went and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead when he knew of it. Uh, the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph and he bought fine linen. So it's clean, it's fine. And he took him down and wrapped him in the linen. So he's on the cross and his body must be taken down and wrapped up like a mummification as the Jews would do. And laid him in a sepulcher which was hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone into the door of the sepulcher. May I just remind you that's how uh, caves and uh, those burial places were taken care of. They were hewn out. That is a very tedious hard work uh, that, was, that had gone into this. And I was going to give it to the darling Lord Jesus, that which he has labored for and worked on. Now Luke chapter 23, very quickly, please. Luke chapter 23. I'll not be able to come back and preach very pointedly in a lot of these scriptures uh, because there's just a lot here. So I do want to make sure that we glean what we can while we're here reading through them. And I'll just allude to them. Some we'll look at again. But Luke chapter 23, verse number 50. As we get a fuller picture of Joseph of Arimathea, what do we find in Luke 23? Notice verse number 50. Behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. Again, that's more material. The same had not consented, watch this, to the counsel and deed of them. So here was a man that sat on the Sanhedrin council, and the Bible said that he would not receive their counsel. Amen? Don't you love the English language? Amen? You can rarely tell what's being said unless you couch it in some type of an immediate context. But, uh, and, and I'm not trying to be tongue-in-cheek. That's literally what's going on here. So he hadn't consented. So there was a consensus of the Pharisees, destroy this man before he destroys us and takes all our money away and all of our followers and all of our prestige. And he said, no, don't think we ought to do that. So there was a disagreement there in his heart with what those religious people want to do. He was of Arimathea, city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. 
Now, the fact that it said he wouldn't consent means that he had an opportunity to either agree or disagree, placing him among those who made that ultimate decision Amen. in the religious world at that time, at the hierarchy. Again, he went into Pilate. The Bible, the Bible tells us now, second time he begged the body of Jesus, and he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in, uh, to, in the stone, wherein never man was laid before. We'll stop. Well, let's, yeah, let's just stop there for the sake of time. Go over now to the book of uh, John real quickly. And we'll try to get this last part. This last part, John chapter number 19. It's just interesting just to learn this so far, amen? But then to follow the story through and see what, how God used him amen. is amazing. John chapter 19 and verse number 38. Now we have been you know, basically preaching character lessons from these men's lives. And you know, bringing principles of the cross in and different things. Uh, today's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to not only we're we going to look at the character of this man, we're going to see the historical event that took place and all the information surrounding his life and the situation historically and religiously. But we're going to use this kind of as a metaphor as well. And there is, I believe, a metaphor that's clearly placed in this. And the Lord showed me this some time ago, and I want to try to bring out that aspect as well. I think you'll understand it better as we begin to go down through and develop this. But notice verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus. Okay, so now he's a disciple of Jesus, okay? But secretly for fear of the Jews. Before you for one second say, I thought he was such a great man. Why is he doing it secretly? Until you're under threat of death or persecution yourself. Don't come talk to me about what you know about being martyred and suffering for Jesus. Because none of us really know anything about right. suffering for Jesus. The closest I probably had to suffering for Jesus is being threatened with arrest, being out on the streets. But, uh, you know, as they used to say, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names can never hurt me. Now, they don't believe that anymore. Words can wound you and kill you, apparently, according to the lefties today. But, uh, no, I've never, I don't know persecution. So understand this. You probably would have reacted the same way. And, uh, but anyway, uh, we never find that he's being rebuked for this. It is simply reported that a follower of Jesus is following secretly. And it was, if you'll study your Baptist history, that sometimes they followed secretly. And other times they did it openly. And sometimes they would fight to defend their families. And other times they were wholesale massacred, believing that God did not want them to take up arms and try to figure out all of those things. And the truth is, well, how do you know? Well, that's what the Holy Spirit is for. And, and in those times, I believe the Holy Spirit will lead. And, but, but notice he's, he's following secretly for fear of the Jews. Because if they were going to be upset, if any Jew followed Jesus, it would have been one of the religious leaders who was not only betraying them, but was also sending the message, all these other guys are wrong, I've got the right position. So he was as dangerous as Jesus when he came out, okay? So let's go a little further. And the Bible said uh, the, the Jews besought Pilate, Joseph did, that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. Now here's where it gets interesting. And there came also Nicodemus. How many ever heard of this guy before? Amen. He's the guy who came also as a religious leader on the council of the Sanhedrin, but by night and wanted to have information about Jesus because he knew he was sent from God because of the miracles Jesus had done. And then Jesus, of course, preached to him, you must be born again. By the way, there's a group out there today that is teaching that John chapter 3 has nothing to do with salvation, but rather it is baptism and being brought forth into the membership of the church. If there's anything that I think the Bible is clear about, it is that which is born of the flesh is flesh. When you came through the water of your mother's womb, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. When you're birthed into the family of God upon your profession of faith in Christ, that is what John 3 is all about, by the way. And it goes into John 3, 30, 36. John 3, 16, 17, 18 is all about salvation of the soul. Just in case you ever come across some crazy person that says something contrary to that. But Nicodemus came. Who's Nicodemus? Which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And <clears throat> we can discuss what that first means. Was he the first to come to Jesus at night? Was he the first, meaning that it was very early in the ministry of Jesus? Well, well, let's just move on. Notice this next part. He brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. So he's going to contribute also. Then took they the body of Jesus together and wound it in linen clothes with the spices 
as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Amen. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was thy hand. Let's pray. Father, bless now. I pray, give us understanding of all things today. And may we have a greater appreciation for the body of Christ upon the uh, end of this message. And may you be glorified through our lives. We love you and thank you. Instruct us now. We pray, Holy Spirit, you lead, guide, and bind devils and demons and all, all distractions away from this building today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to jump right in. Let me just say it's great, first of all, to be gathered together with professed believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, there's some things that we greatly agree upon, and they're the really the most important things in life. These are the things that pertain unto life and godliness, issues of eternity. And I think, first of all, we would all agree that the centerpiece of our faith is the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ that He alone accomplished on the cross of Calvary when He died for the sins of the whole world. Amen. The cross, we believe, is the pinnacle of all human history. It is that which history is divided upon. Uh, it is where Amen. the event took place that pertains unto every man, woman, uh, boy and girl that ever lived upon this planet and shall live upon this planet. And we further believe that not only was the cross efficacious uh, in past time to come for our salvation of the day that we were saved, but it is importance, it, it, of importance every single day. Amen. We are constantly to be considering him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest we be weary and faint in our minds. We should live under the shadow of the cross. We should live our lives very near to the cross of Calvary. Always remembering when we suffer, he suffered greater. As we serve God, he set the example. No matter what it is in life, it is all interconnected with what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It is where I draw my strength from. It is where I draw my inspiration from. It is why I wake up every day with a spring in my step and, and a smile on my face because I know that Jesus Christ both died and was buried, but also so that he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. But today I don't want to talk uh, specifically about the cross per se. I will get into it a bit. But I want to go just beyond the beating of Christ. And I don't want to talk about you know him leading up to the cross in the garden. We've been to all those places on the Calvary Road. But I'd like to pick up the story just after Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross of Calvary. Amen. Now just stop for a moment. <clears throat> May I take your mind to a mountain shaped like a skull. I've been there in Israel and I've seen where at one time before it became more worn down than what it is, you could literally see about a 30 foot tall and 20 foot wide shape of a skull right on the front face of about a 30 foot tall rock ledge where Jesus Christ was crucified right on the top of that. By the way, as you stand there at the bottom, Stephen was stoned right on that very spot uh, below Calvary there. But the Savior, when he had died there on Calvary, and after the earth stopped reeling, I want you to understand there were several crowds there and, uh, that were alive during this time, and many of them with diverse opinions about who this man was. Should he have been put to death? And why was he put to death? And now what does this mean for the world? And let me just first of all point out that obviously many were happy upon the death of Jesus. Amen. There again was a religious crowd that hated him. I mean, with, with such a, a perfect hatred, they wanted him gone. And no doubt some of them were very happy. I believe the devils of hell were dancing the jig and passing out party favors and probably drinking their uh, Bud Dumber that got down at the Jericho Mart. Amen. But I mean, there was a crowd that was very happy, thought they had done away with Jesus for good and that he was never going to have to be dealt with again. But you know, also when Jesus died, I believe there was a crowd that was very sad. There were those that had believed him, that had received him, that were following him. And now they're disillusioned and his disciples don't know which way to turn. And Martha and Mary, and you look at all of these people, no doubt there were some that were just wondering what's going to happen. And others, maybe, you know, they were the, the ones that wanted the revolt and they wanted Rome to be overthrown. And they were sad because of that reason. But yet there were others, no doubt, that had their heart changed. We've already taken a good look at the centurion and how that right there, at the foot of Calvary. He had a heart change and maybe he felt some things about Jesus but there when he saw him talking to the Father and saving a man on the cross and when the earthquake happened and all of those things that were done, he said surely this was the Son of God and I believe that he was changed right then and there. <clears throat> so there's a lot of different factions, a lot of different viewpoints. However, when the dust settled, 
There was one thing that all of these different groups concurred upon. One thing they agreed upon, and that was this, that Jesus Christ was absolutely physically dead. I mean, 100% as dead as anybody in any graveyard. Well, we all know what happens when someone dies. Normally, they're given a Christian burial or at least some type of a dignified burial. There's usually a plan of some type on how to deal with the body and, you know, after death and even the basis of men have their bodies, you know, treated with a level of respect. There's a sense of dignity when somebody passes away. In our land, we actually have laws that prohibit, you know, the, the desecration of a corpse, the mishandling of a corpse, even transportation of a corpse is highly regulated. There's rules for all of those things which have violated are punishable by law. Now, all of that being said, there was absolutely no organized plan for the burial of the very Son of God. What you think about that? If there was ever one in history who should have been honored, should have been revered, should have been taken care of with the utmost love and respect and adoration, should it not have been the Lord of glory who came down to save everybody uh, that would turn to him? But there was no plan. If you think about it for a moment, there were reasons for this. Would it not have been unthinkable to plan his burial? First of all, as I've done my studies, I find a lot of different viewpoints on this historically. But one of the things I find is that oftentimes, if not probably the majority of the time, crucified bodies were left hanging on crosses as a warning after their death against others who might attempt dissent against Rome. What they were saying was, look at this body. Here it hangs day after day. This is what happens if you try to go up against Rome. Amen. Now keep in mind today that the death of the Roman cross was demeaning. It was humiliating in many ways. And I want to rehearse this and remind you of the humiliation of a Roman cross. I touched on this a bit last week inadvertently. It was just on my heart. But the historians concur that when one hand on the cross had to urinate or defecate, think about the fact that Christ had to do that in open public view. This would attract insects to his body. It would add great humiliation to the one hanging on the cross. When the blood in the crucified man's body uh, was coagulating and when it was drying up on his body, uh, it would attract bugs and even birds of prey. With the one hanging there, unable to do anything about it, but to endure the further shame of the, the, the things and the, the animals of the world even coming upon them. Struggling to pull in another breath was the only concern of the average crucified man. And of course, one man hanging on a cross, we know, his concern was, what will happen to me when I die? Thank God for that. Amen. Which, yeah. by the way, proves that baptism cannot possibly save you. Right. Uh, when the thief on the cross got saved by looking through the eye of faith, as far as we know, as a male factor, meaning a worker of iniquity, had never done a good thing in his whole life. It wasn't his baptism and church membership and anything else that he had done. He was lost. In fact, he was so evil, society was ridding themselves of him. And yet, through the eye of faith, he was immediately promised eternity with Jesus Christ. Your baptism cannot save you. You're going to have to humble yourself before Christ. Back to the cross. Once the victim died an anxious and a very painful death, an agony as it were, as difficult to watch almost as it was to endure because of the inhumanity in it and the absolute anguish upon the face and the gyrations of the body and the blood and the guts and all of that. But immediately upon the death, the corpse would begin to go through the rigor mortis process where the chemical changes in the muscles cause the limbs of the corpse to become stiff and difficult to move. And I will remind you that Jesus Christ died in a human body. In humans, this commences after about three or four hours and reaches maximum stiffness at about 12 hours. Now let me just say, for anyone present, to attempt to hold an honorable funeral would have meant to stir up the already angry crowds of Jews. To identify with this troublemaker, Jesus, who had caused so much dissension, who had supposedly lied to so many people and supposedly blasphemed his very own father, whom he came to do the will of. For anyone to attempt to hold an honorable funeral would have made all the Jews very angry. To identify with this troublemaker and blasphemer would have cost anybody very dearly. Now let me stop and interject. I want to try to introduce this metaphor, if I may. Don't miss the picture of this. May I tell you today that it does cost something to identify with the body of Christ. 
it will, there's going to be some people that are going to hate you for it. I thought, man, when I got saved, got in church, the whole world was going to be like, man, the dope head got saved. Isn't this awesome? And yet I found that I had as many enemies or more than I did people that were happy that I got into church. It's going to cost you something to stay faithful Man. to a local New Testament church. To get up and go when you feel like it, when you don't feel like it, to serve God, to stand for God, to invite people, to witness for Him, and to Man. live for Jesus. By the way, that's why the community's not flocking in here. Now I'll tell you, some people, thank God they come in they say, hey, real church, old time preaching, the old hymns of the faith, not shenanigans, not a rock concert. We just want the old time religion. And yet others come in and say, Oh man, real church. They don't want real church, man. They don't want to sell out for God. They don't want to hear about sanctification, righteousness, and holiness, and witnessing, and missions, and church planning. They don't want to hear about loving your spouse and raising kids for God and, and selling out, being a real testimony for God. But I tell you, if you stand for God and you identify with the body of Christ, it'll cost you something. Now listen, the Bible equates the local New Testament church with the body of Christ. There are three New Testament metaphors that God uses, the body, the building, and the bride. Ephesians chapter 1, for example, verse 22 and 23 said, and, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave unto me to head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now that is not a universal floating mystical body. That is the institution of Jesus is my church, always and only manifested by local assemblies with people, ordinances, laws, a great commission, and all of that. And so the Bible equates the church to the body of Christ. First Corinthians 1 27. Now ye are, he said to the church of God, which is at Corinth, a local New Testament assembly, the body of Christ. So you say, well, is there a bunch of bodies? No, but they represented the body of Christ at Corinth as we are the body of Christ here in Homestead. And then it goes on and says, and members in particular. Now listen to me carefully. No one was willing to identify with the body of Christ upon his death. No one that is except for one man. And he is the subject of our investigation today. His name is Joseph of Arimathea. And he's the subject of our focus. I called him a true disciple when I opened the message because he was willing to pay a price and sacrifice for the body of Christ and take a great risk to show Jesus Christ just how much he loved him. I want to consider a few things as we examine this man today and everything is going to build into the final act of his love and devotion to Christ that I believe is a beautiful picture that if you missed it and you never really stopped and meditated on it, you're missing something great in the Bible. Let's consider a few things. First of all, I want you to realize that by the world's standards, this guy Joseph had everything a man supposedly needs prior to the death of Jesus Christ. From his friends that surrounded him, from those in his family, it seems as though they would have looked at him and they would have said, hey, why on earth would you go do something like this? You've already got everything that you need. You know, the world's on a quest. They've got their life's backpack, their bucket list. And I've got my retirement, my 401k, my nice car, my nice house, and I've got this and that. And, and you know, everybody in the community thinks I'm an upstanding citizen. I've got a little bit of clout here, and I can, you know, throw my elbows around over there. And that's really the way that the world thinks in a lot of cases. Man. But to understand the man he became and to understand what Joseph did with the body of Jesus, it is important that we remember what his life was like before he got saved. The world would have looked at him and said, hey, you're rich. Don't mess things up. I mean, honestly, the religious crowd has always had a good monetary thing going. Amen. By the way, I'm not the religious crowd. I'm a true minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there's a lot of charlatans. They're in it just to pad their pocket and to become rich. But this guy, hey, he already had a bunch of money. This was not going to promote him financially doing what he did with Jesus. And I'll just tell you that, folks. If you want riches, you're never going to be a good servant of Jesus Christ. If they're what you look at, they're your folks. Focus. That's what you live for. You will never properly be used of God. But hey, isn't that what the world says? Hey, I got my money, man. I'm good to go. Surely Joseph at one time felt this way as he was climbing the ladders of success. Not only that, but he's a very religious man. 
He had esteem in the religious world. He sat on the Sanhedrin council. He was at the pinnacle of dead Jewry. Amen. By the way, I'd rather be on the bottom of true Christianity and be the church mouse than to be at the pinnacle of dead religion. Amen. And that's exactly where he was. But at one time, this satisfied him just to appear religious, just to appear as though he was a representative of God. And then I want you to understand, he had a right standing in his community. He was a good man and a just. And the Bible tells us, you know, people looked at him and said, hey, he's a guy who take the shirt off his back to help you. No doubt he was a, quote, good man in the world sense. He would have done a lot of good deeds. But I'm saying all that to say this. Seemingly, this man had everything that the world says you need prior to the death of Jesus Christ. Amen. But then something happened in his life. One day he heard about a man from Galilee. Amen. One day he heard about a man that was performing unexplainable miracles and, and that had walked on water and was healing the deaf and the blind. And all of a sudden, listen, and after he met Jesus amazingly, he became willing to risk everything to follow him. Think about it, folks. I mean, this is absolutely amazing. I can imagine his family coming and saying, you're going to do what? You're going to follow who? You're risking your religion. You're risking all of your esteem. You're risking your finances. You're going to throw your whole life's religious studies away. They did not understand it. But once he met Jesus, he was willing, as Paul was, to count all of that as done to do what the Father had placed in his heart. May I remind you what that was? To carefully handle and take care of the body of Christ. I hope you're thinking of the metaphor. Amen. All right, let me move on. Secondly, I want you to notice he had been touched by the gospel prior to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to take your Bible very quickly. Go to John chapter 19. You may still have your Bible open there. <clears throat> I want you to see this. Now, I want to give you a theory, and I don't know how accurate or correct this is, but I hope it will get you thinking about Scripture. Hope it'll get you running some of these scriptures through your brain and you come out with what, how you think it may have happened. <clears throat> there are some things we know about this, some things that I don't exactly know, but I'm assuming there are some things that had to have fallen out somewhat like this. For example, notice John 19 and verse number 38. The Bible said there in verse number 38, and after this, Joseph Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews besought Pilate, that he might take, take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. So the Bible tells us he's following Jesus for some time secretly before the crucifixion. Now here's my theory. And I'm letting you know this is my theory. And I'm just wondering maybe if it happened this way. Uh, I believe he very well could have been a convert of Nicodemus. Now, why do I say that? Go back to John chapter 3. Hold your finger here for just a second. <clears throat> Go back to John chapter 3. We've already read in our opening text that this is a man that first came to Jesus. And now we see the actual historical account of it. Very early in John's gospel here. The Bible said in chapter 3 verse 1, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, Joseph wouldn't consent to a judgment telling us he was also a Pharisee on the same council with Nicodemus. For sake of time, I'll not stay there and belabor that point, but he came to talk to Jesus very early. Now, here's my theory. I've wondered maybe at some of these council meetings if maybe it was that Nicodemus pulled Joseph aside. Maybe he said something like this. I'm just speculating. Hey, can I talk to you after the council meeting tonight? You know, they're really talking about making a plan to get rid of this guy. And I'm wondering, maybe did he say something like, meet me down by the juniper tree afterwards. And maybe they went down there and Nicodemus, who was one of the first to be converted, who first went to Jesus, now he's secretly spreading the gospel to another man who's going to become a secret disciple. Now I'm wondering, maybe they're down there talking and he says, hey, I just want you to know, I went to talk to this man, Jesus. How many believe that Nicodemus was a witness? Amen. Here he is with his friend who now is also saved, taking care of the body of Jesus. Now I'm wondering, did he say something to the effect of, I went to talk to him and I asked him some questions and here's where Jesus gives him the dissertation, looks him square in his God-given eyeballs and says, he must be born again. Marvel not that I say to thee, you must be born again. And, and, and he said, you know, maybe, maybe he said something like this. Jesus uh, began to talk to me with words like I had never heard before. 
word. It seemed as though God was speaking through him Amen. and it was touching my heart. And at some point we know that Nicodemus became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And just maybe he spread it to this man Joseph. Can you imagine these two sneaking around? And uh, now there's a vote that's going to be taken. And I'm sure they're scared to death to oppose the crowd that was there. I'm just telling you this, just sneaking around following Jesus. However, he came to Christ. We're not exactly sure. I think someday we'll probably find out Nicodemus went and witnessed to him. Maybe they were real close friends prior to that. But he had great courage before the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me go on thirdly and quickly. I'm getting somewhere. And then he demonstrated great faith after Jesus' death on the cross. I want to give you just a couple thoughts. First of all, he denied his flesh. I want you to picture with me Pilate's Hall. Roman soldiers, a garrison. We have them flanking Pilate, protecting him, his own personal guard. And this Jew, this dog to the Romans, believe it or not, because the Romans were dogs to the Jews, he's going to come into the Roman court now. And he's going to ask something of Pilate. But he doesn't just come in in any old way. But think about this. And think about the embarrassment of a Jew who looked at the Romans like dogs to go in and to beg a Roman for anything. I'm literally picturing literally what the text says. Does it not tell us of a posture? Does it not tell us of a posture of his heart? Now wondering, did he go in and cast himself down and say, please, I know it's not the custom, but can I please take the body? Was he begging? Was he pleading? Were the soldiers standing around jeering? Were they mocking this foolish Jew after this man had caused so much trouble? Now he's going to risk his own death, which is what it meant to identify with the body of Jesus. And I'm just telling you, I see the heart of a man who didn't care what happened to him. Him. The father laid it upon his heart to take care of the body of his son. And he said, even if I die, I'm going to go beg for the body of Jesus. He was looking for a way to serve the body of Christ. And most people I know is trying to get out of the way. Most people I know, they've got every excuse in the book why they can't serve in the local New Testament church. This man said, hey, I want the body of Christ. Let me go on further and say that he demonstrated great faith and that he sacrificed his position on the Sanhedrin. Get, get this straight. As soon as they found out, like we're not going to vote on it, he's a goner. Like we're not even going to discuss it. This man, not only is he a goner, let's find him and kill him. We don't know exactly what happened to this man after this, but I'm going to tell you what, he himself stirred up some really troublesome waters for his own life by going and doing what he was about to do. I can imagine as he was going to do it, maybe news already got back to the Pharisees. Maybe they were hot on their heels. We just don't know. But I'm telling you, there must have been a lot of trouble. But again, he said, hey, I'm going to obey the Father. I'm going to take care of the body of Christ. And it doesn't matter what it costs me. We need people today with that same type of spirit. I'm going to serve the local church. And I'm going to serve God through his church. And it doesn't matter what people do to me. Now let me say this. He abandoned his reputation among family and friends. We've already touched on this. But can you imagine his family when they found this out? You do this and I'll never talk to you again. Maybe. Maybe those were going to be embarrassed by the other Jews because it was Man. their brother, their son, their cousin, their nephew that was going to do something so atrocious. There was no doubt tremendous family pressure ridiculing him and saying, you're crazy. You're going to gamble away everything. I'm going to tell you what, if you're ever going to serve God, you're going to have to hate your mama and your father. I'm not talking about the kind of hate the world thinks of, but the kind where Jesus said that. What he means is you need to not prefer them above God Almighty. That's what Jesus said when he said, if you hate not your father and your mother and your own life also, you cannot be my disciple. But look, if you're going to follow God, there's going to be family that opposes you. But you know what he said? I'm going to take care of the body of Christ and obey the Father. No matter what family says, by the way, family will watch after a while. And when their kids go to the dogs and they see yours, they'll say, wow, maybe he's right about some things. Amen. And when they see you're happy and they're in their seventh marriage, they'll say, wow, maybe I should have listened 40 years ago. And we don't rub it in their face. I'm just telling you, wisdom's justified of her children. You may take some ridicule now, but down the road, friend, you walk the path of God and you will find it's, it grows brighter and brighter on your more perfect day. 
Joseph of Arimathea demonstrated strong faith in the Son of God. Didn't seem to care who found out about his newfound faith. There's no secret disciples today. If you're a disciple, it must be open. Now I want to get to, to my final point. I've got 700 sub points. Apparently I've got a lot of sub things going on in my preaching. Amen. I think Brother Zach's in the running for it. He's trying to keep up with me. Amen. In Sunday school. Amen. I want to, want to make a point. He simply wanted to make an offering to show his love for Christ no matter the cost. Amen. Would you notice the kind of offering that he made? And I want you to specifically watch the way that he and Nicodemus handled the body of Christ. First of all, we remember that his offering was clean. Clean linen. Folks, what we offer to God, it must be done for purity of heart. Amen. What we offer to God, we do because we want to do it. I don't browbeat people into service. I never will because if you're doing something for me or you're doing something to save face, even with the church body or a spouse or a friend, you're not doing it for the right reason. But I love when people come to me and say, Preacher, how can I help? What can I do? Or they come with a smile and I know they're doing it. And I'm doing it because we all love God and everybody ought to love God with what they do. So his offering was given uh, clean linen with clean hands. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there remembers that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar. Go thy way first, be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. The Lord was simply saying, if you're going to serve me, if you're going to worship me, make sure that your heart is right with me. Much more I could say. Let me move on quickly and say this. Our offerings must be given not only with clean hands, but with clean hearts. Amen. Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. His offering also included myrrh and aromatic resin, as Christ's death was a sweet smell in the nostrils of God. It included aloes. Now, if you think about it, it's interesting to put aloes and to put them on a body that, you know, was never going to rise again. Because aloes actually have healing qualities to them. It is, an aloe is the juice of a plant that is made into paste and different types of lotions and liquids. But all of them have healing qualities. And I believe that was typological. Or, or maybe it, it was even prophetic in the sense that when they rubbed this on his body, they knew they were keeping his body nice and supple and soft because it was going to rise again in three days. Amen? Amen. But they used spices. Many of those exist today, and they all exist to spice up our lives. Amen. Christ came to give us life more abundantly. Beautiful picture there. He off what he offered also had great worth, a hundred pound weight. Offerings we give in purity of heart are of great worth to God. Amen. And then let me say his offering cost him personally. I want to park on this one for a minute. Let's go back to that tomb. When's the last time? Now Luke was out working the other day, and he's telling me some of the stuff he's doing. I think he dug, I don't know, how many holes did you dig? 70 some holes or something like that? Luke's digging holes out there at the farm he's working on. And, uh, you know, he's got gloves. And I remember, you ever go out and work real hard and you forgot the gloves and you came home with blistered hands? You only have to do that once, amen? <laughs> Old people don't do that. We, can, we remember that very well, amen? That's a lot of pain. Have you ever gone to a big rock face and taken a chisel with a five pound sledge and just start cracking rock. It's really, really fun. Let me let me help you. I used to spike railroad, railroad tracks. I'd do it all day sometimes. I don't think it was one of the most tedious. You talk about energy, you could eat 12 meals that day and still burn it all off. But I cannot imagine walking up to a rock face and just constantly hitting it until it chips out a place big enough to walk in, walk over and bury bodies and walk back out this man had spent a lot of his own time and his own effort, his blood, his sweat, his Amen. tears went into this tomb that was for he and for his family, or so he thought. And then God said, give it to my son. You know, it's amazing. Oftentimes God has given me things I thought were for me, and God said, give it to my son. Amen? I remember in evangelism, people give me the craziest things. They say, preacher, I've got this $900 copy here. We don't need it anymore because this and this. Can you use it? And I'd say, well, no. And they'd say, well, maybe you can find somebody that can. And they'd coax me into it. And I'd put this monster in the underbelly of my bus. And I'd pull out. And I'm telling you, things like this happened all the time. I'd drive like 587 miles, pull in at some church out in the wilderness. And one of the first things out of the pastor's mouth is, uh, you know, pray for us. We're, we're wanting to get a new copy or we didn't get many flyers out. <laughs> oh, really? Because, you know, right here in my underbelly, God answered your prayer before you ever told me about it. 
I'm telling you, there's a lot of things that a lot of people are building up a nest egg and they're building barns bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to store it. And, and once in a while, God will say, hey, wait a minute. You thought that was for you. I want you to give some of that to my son. Amen. Amen. And I'm just saying, here's a man that worked and labored on this. And the father said, give it to my son. And without hesitation, he said, I'd be honored to give that for your son. Amen. Now, I just want to stop and give you one final thought. Go to the cross with me for a minute. Here's Nicodemus, and here's Joseph of Arimathea. Now, I'm just, I'm just going to try to play this out in my mind how I think it would have felt to have been there. Imagine walking to the cross, and first of all, my question is, who is sufficient for these things? To touch the body of God. Who is sufficient to handle this body, to take care of it? You certainly wouldn't want to make a mistake. I promise you this, they weren't snapping bubble gum and making jokes. They weren't talking about NASCAR and football and everything else. It was sober-minded and very serious to handle the body of Christ. Now, this is the crux of where God dealt with me about this message. Because the Holy Spirit came to my heart and said, How do you handle the body of Christ? Do you abuse the sheep? Do you love the sheep? Do you feed the sheep or do you just throw them table scraps? Do you serve them or do you use them to serve yourself? Are you trying to teach them how to build the kingdom of God or are you using them to build your own persona and your own kingdom? And God dealt with me very severely about how each one of us handles the body of Christ. Can I tell you, coming to church is a privilege. Being a member is a privilege. Being baptized is a privilege. Serving God, it, is the, it ought to be the greatest joy of our life. We should never look at it as a drudgery. So these men come up and they have to take down the cross. And I promise you they were handling it very, very carefully to take down the cross. And when they laid it down, I wonder, did they lay it on a nice, clean, flat area where, where there was a rock of some sort? But then think with me, folks. They had to remove the spikes from his hands and from his feet. Have you ever thought about that, that Joseph and Nicodemus physically had to remove the spikes that, the, that were put into the body of Jesus. And I promise you, you're going to tear up the body. Amen. And I'm very careful, folks. I, I fail all the time, but I never want to tear up the body of Christ. I want to edify it and build it up and treat it the way God would have me to treat it. And I, I'm sure that it's very much a, a process of being careful to remove those spikes from the body of Jesus. And then the Bible tells us that they took these aloes and the myrrhs and, and the spices and they begin to apply it 100 pound weight over the body of Jesus. And I thought in my mind what that would have been like to have been there when they did this process. And the Bible began to come to life in my mind as I saw them first starting at the feet of Jesus and wiping it on his feet and literally the whole through the feet of Jesus Christ where they push that, that, that mixture into his body to preserve it uh, for his burial. And then to go up the legs of Jesus. And can you imagine them across from one another? I don't, again, I don't see that there was a, a cockiness about them. I believe that they were probably as broken as they ever were in their entire life. Possibly Amen. two men weeping as they're trying to handle the body of Christ. Amen. Can I tell you folks? This is very precious to God, His church. His body is very, very precious to Him. And we ought to come to church trying to encourage and edify and love and pay attention and have a good spirit and a good attitude and serve God and handle it very, very carefully. And I thought about what it must have been like when they came to the stripes where that whip had laid open His body and began to fill those places with all of that myrrh and that mixture. And then to think about them coming to not only the feet, but the hands of Jesus. And then ultimately coming up to the very face of God. Can you imagine touching the face of God? Not like Judas did, but to very carefully under the supervision of the Father, watching you as a believer in the Son to handle the very face of Jesus Christ. I'm just telling you, I believe there was a meticulousness and, and there was a brokenness. They're very careful to be guided by the Lord in how they took care of the body of Christ. Amen. May I just say, everything you do in this church, out of this church, it reflects upon this church. And if you want this church to be a, a great soul-saving station that really brings maximum glory to God, it has everything to do with how you approach the church and how your attendance, your love for, your prayers for, your service through the church. Amen.
And then they begin to wrap him up after that very carefully, almost like a mummification process, all clean and white linen. And then the Bible tells us they took him over and they carried him and placed him in a brand new tomb where never any man laid. And that in itself, again, was another sacrifice. As I looked at this, and I thought about how Joseph was changed when he heard about Jesus, nothing could have stopped him and deterred him from going up Calvary that day. Nothing could have stopped him from barging into Pilate's Hall, falling on his face and saying, please, can I do this for my father? It didn't matter what his family said. It didn't matter what the religious crowd said. It didn't matter what the townspeople said. He was going to serve God and give everything to take care of the body of Christ. Folks, God left us here on this earth that we might serve the Spirit of God serving in and through us, but you and I in and through the local New Testament church. And I don't know about you, but when I see the life of Joseph, I'm challenged to be a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has called me to take care of his body, but he's called every one of us to take care of the body of Jesus Christ as well. Amen. How you act at work reflects on how you're taking care of the body of Jesus. Whether you attend, whether you give, whether you serve, whether you have a good attitude, whether you actually listen, learn, and grow and are changed, all of that reflects upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I was challenged by this. I hope that you are today. A man named Joseph, you hear very little about. And yet here's a man that did one of the greatest things that anybody ever did. He took our Savior's body and placed him in the tomb where he would one day, three days later, rise again. Thank God for the memory of these men. It's going to be awesome to meet him someday. And then you can say, my preacher said this. Did, did, did he win you to the Lord? Amen. And you go ask him. Amen. We can all rejoice in heaven to meet these great servants of the Lord. Let's be of this company, amen, that loves God from the heart. Father, I thank you for Joseph of Arimathea. Lord, I only fear that this feeble tongue cannot do justice. We're trying to figure it out, trying to understand it, Lord. And Lord, I've got my plate full, just what I do understand. And Lord, I pray that each one of us would esteem the body of Christ as highly as Joseph did, as highly as Nicodemus did. For Nicodemus to spend that money on those spices and things. And Amen. for Joseph to give away his tomb. And for both of them to sacrifice everything that they previously had. The world thought they was all set. And they gave it all up for Jesus. Lord, help us to be that kind of disciple. A real deal, biblical disciple. To love you with all of our hearts, Father. Lord, I pray, God, that you would build this church. Spiritually, physically, monetarily, in every single way. Build our missions, build our outreach, 